So we're in a series uh, called Life and Leadership Lessons uh, from Teddy Roosevelt. And this session is called Four Eyes. And uh, the Boyders ordered special glasses, so uh, I at least should put them on. They're Teddy Roosevelt glasses. And I don't know, I mean, does this enhance the look? I mean, do you guys have more respect for me uh, with the Teddy glasses on? I need a mustache. I definitely need a mustache. Uh, and so maybe I'll start working on that and then put these glasses on again. Maybe by the end of the series, is that, is that a... No, I'm, I'm, I doubt I'm going to do that. So just in case you're wondering. I, I don't think I can speak with these glasses on, uh, but that at least gives you an idea, gets you in the, the spirit uh, of it. So if you haven't heard the first three episodes, I highly encourage you to go back and catch up because... This is sort of a snowball that's getting bigger and bigger. We're sort of establishing the basis of what made this man who he is. And the first three episodes are actually really powerful, pithy, and surprising, I would say. Uh, this fourth one is sort of in the same grouping because I'm giving them all in one night. It's like a Daily Thunder event that we're giving. And I have another Daily Thunder event uh, where I'm going to do four more, and that's going to be January 6th, 7th, 7th at 6.30 p.m. in the chapel. So if you want to join that, if you're listening to this uh, and you're you're like jealous of all these people that get to hear it live, uh, because it's pretty fun, isn't it? Uh, Then you can join us next go around for this. But uh, this will be a fun finish. This is a very interesting take on uh, this man. And what shocks me, if you heard the bully buffalo hunt, it shocks me how much detail we know about a buffalo hunt that happened way back in 1883. And the same is true with this story. This is so legendary, it entered into the myth of the Wild West. And I'm just calling it Fearless Four Eyes. William Hazelgrove in his book, Forging a President said this, glasses were not worn in the West. They were looked upon as a weakness. And what's more, they marked a man forever as an Easterner. There were only a few who wore glasses, but they were small and oval. Roosevelt's glasses were large and round, giving him the look of an owl under a cowboy hat. The nickname Four Eyes would follow him, and not as a term of respect. But Theodore Roosevelt was essentially blind without his glasses and could never be without them. This set him up as a man who was frequently underestimated. William Hazelgrove continues... One time he was assisting in rounding up some calves and called out to the men, hasten forward quickly there. The cowboys roared at his proper English and from then on they threw aside their own head off them cattle for hasten forward quickly there. The fact was that the boss in the buckskin coat and glasses was a bit of a joke. This was a world where men had to prove themselves and all Roosevelt had proven was that he had money to buy a ranch. This is, a, this is a tough crowd, guys. So he goes out to the Wild West, and everyone is treating him as if he's just a guy with a lot of money. And he doesn't look the part. In fact, he bought a whole bunch of expensive cowboy gear before he came out, and it looked probably rather brand new. And of course, with his glasses, it's just, you know, he's not being taken seriously. William Hazelgrove continues, Roosevelt had a sense of propriety, and to him there were lines that should not be crossed. Once he went to town to get his mail, visit Joe Ferris, remember uh, Joe Ferris, the buffalo hunter, visit Joe Ferris's new store and shoot the breeze with Arthur Packard at the Badlands Cowboy. When he bumped into Bill Jones, uh uh-oh, a legendary hell-roaring bad man of the area. He was a gunslinger with the build of a fighter, long arms, barrel chest, thick neck with black eyes that gleamed under bushy brows. In short, he was the Wild West menace, the model for a hundred Western bad guys to come. Jones's favorite pastime was to hang out in the saloon and tell stories in the foulest language imaginable. One day, Jones was holding court in the office of the Badlands Cowboy when Roosevelt was there. Roosevelt might be considered a prig. He drank in college, but he never would admit it, and he never really spoke of sex outside the context of procreation. So for him, there were boundaries, and Bill Jones had crossed the line. Bill Jones, he said, looking into the other man's eyes, I can't tell why in the world I like you, for you're the nastiest talking man I ever heard. Bill Jones's hand went to his gun, and the cowboys in the office of the Badlands Cowboy expecting shooting, ex- were expecting shooting. Silence reigned in the dusty planked room, and the grizzled gunfighter facing the four-eyed man from the east in his cowboy getup. Everyone knew it would be a one-sided fight, but then a strange thing happened. 
Maybe it was the unwavering eyes or the trace of hard bark in Roosevelt's demeanor. But whatever the reason, Bill Jones turned sheepish. I don't belong to your outfit, Mr. Roosevelt, and I am not beholden to you for anything. All the same, I don't mind saying that maybe I've been a little too free with my mouth. From then on, they became friends. Roosevelt had passed an early test, though to him it was just given that a man should not talk so foully. The code of the West was simply that, a man, that a man had to back up what he said, and in this regard, Teddy Roosevelt came well-armed. But still, Roosevelt could perhaps have felt a nervous sweat cooling on his brow as he walked out of that office. Things easily could have gone the other way. So the code of the Wild West, a man has to back up what he says. You know, I was pondering that line because it's an obscure statement in, you know, this man's just rendition of the history. But that's true in most zones of life that, you see, this isn't a normal culture. This isn't the normal society. This is a place that is, yeah, a little rough around the edges and a little uh, wild. And so a man has to back up what he says. And so I was pondering this, and I'm going to put this up on the screen, the code of the wild spiritual war. A Christian has to back up what he or she, she says. You know that when you make bold statements with your mouth, the devil's going to come back and test that bold statement, which is actually why some of us stop making bold statements. It's like, whoa, whoa, I don't want to mess with that. Do you guys remember the story, first semester Ellerslie? It was July 4th. I'm sure you guys are going to remember this. July 4th of 2010, I believe it was. And I got up on the stage and I gave a message called Immovable. And I was talking about the, the man who built his house upon the rock and the man who built his house upon the sand, you know, when the winds and the rains beat, then, that, you know, the man who built his house upon the rock, he would not be moved, he would, his house would not fall. And I made a statement <clears throat> to the heavenlies. I will not be moved! is what I said. That day, in Colorado, mind you, which is not the most normal place for rains of this nature, came a flash flood, and my basement flooded. The very day I got up onto stage and made this bold declaration, believe me, that was in the back of my mind as I was trying to bail water as it was pouring in through a window well. I mean, we had so much rain come down in a matter of like a half hour. I've never seen anything quite like it. And so I was a little shaken, I have to admit. And it was about a month later that I got up the guts to get back up onto the stage, reference that situation, and say I'm not going to be intimidated. When I say I'm not going to be moved, because I was a little moved, by the way, in the situation, I mean it. I'm not going to be moved. That day, <clears throat> we had a flash flood, and my basement flooded. I'm not making this up, guys. This really happened in my life. So I don't know, a month later, it might have been less, hopefully I was shorter time that I get up my guts again to do this. And I got up onto this stage, I referenced the first two situations, and I made a declaration, I will not be moved. We had just transitioned our, uh, uh, our washing machine and dryer to a new spot in the house. And the guy just the day before had finished it and said, yeah, it's all set up, you can use it. But we hadn't used it yet. Sunday morning, before we left for church, I don't know why we thought that was a good time to have our first load of wash go through. But the discharge hose from the washing machine was not put where it was supposed to, it was laying under the washing machine. So our upstairs flooded and it went into our basement and our basement flooded. Three straight times. Now, I'm going to skip to the rest of the story. Six straight times in the first year. Six. This happened. Okay, so you could understand why when I say that you have to be able to back up the words you speak, that the guy speaking to you actually knows a thing or two about this. That we have an enemy that doesn't really like us to talk, to proclaim, to speak. But if you're going to speak, you need to know the God in whom you speak. You need to have a rest point to know that he is a shield and a guard and the enemy cannot stop you. The enemy is a bunch of bluff and bluster. But you have to back up with action the words that you speak. This is a spiritual battle. You either believe it or you don't. If you don't believe it, you go home. If you do believe it, you enter into the Wild West. Teddy Roosevelt is in the Wild West right now, and we're going to see something about this guy's character that is rather 
Shocking, actually. Here's a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. I heard one or two shots in the bar room as I came up, and I disliked going in. But there was nowhere else to go, and it was a cold night. Inside the room were several men who, including the bartender, were wearing the kind of smile worn by men who are making to believe to like what they don't like. A shabby individual in a broad hat with a cocked gun in each hand was walking up and down the floor talking with strident profanity. He had evidently been shooting at the clock, which had two or three holes in its face. Doesn't this sound like an old Western movie? As soon as he saw me, he hailed me as four eyes in reference to my spectacles and said, four eyes is going to treat. I joined in the laugh and got behind the stove and sat down thinking to escape notice. He followed me, however, and though I tried to pass it off as a jest, this merely made him more offensive. And he stood leaning over me, a gun in each hand, using very foul language. We already know that Teddy Roosevelt doesn't really like foul language. In response to his reiterated command that I should set up the drinks, I said, well, if I've got to, I've got to, and rose, looking past him. As I rose, I struck quick and hard with a right just to one side of the point of his jaw, hitting with my left as I straightened out, and then again with my right. He fired the guns, but I do not know whether this was merely a convulsive action of his hands or whether he was trying to shoot at me. When he went down to... St when he went down, he struck the corner of the bar with his head. If he had moved, I was about to drop on his ribs with my knees, but he was senseless. I took away his guns and the other people in the room who were now loud in their denunciation of him, hustled him out and put him in a shed. This is what William Hazelgrove says. When Roosevelt left the next day, he must have known that he too had passed into the myth of the Wild West. The news of the lone rider from the east facing down the gunman in the saloon made the rounds. Buffalo Bill riding in to save the day had nothing on Theodore Roosevelt at that moment. The west was a small community where lore and fact were mixed frequently into a potent mythology. The story of Roosevelt's showdown took on more drama as it circulated until he was no less a hero than Gary Cooper in High Noon. Frank Green, who was the official of the Northern Pacific, said Roosevelt was regarded by the cowboys as a good deal of a joke until the saloon incident. After that, it was different. You see, if we were to describe the Christian life, I have a hunch that us as young believers with our bravado, and we know that we have a position in Christ, we know that we have authority in the name of Jesus, and we start barking about it. And the enemy looks at us as a joke. They have no idea. They can't back that up. They don't really understand what it means to stand in the authority of Christ. And so he will put us to the test. And he'll tell us, you know, to buy a round of drinks. And yet, it's shocking in this story. I don't think any of us expect Teddy Roosevelt. He's skinny still at this time, by the way, guys. But he had trained. I mean, he's like daily training. He's a boxer. And you sort of see it come out here. All of this overcoming his asthmatic weaknesses suddenly transforms him into a myth and legend in the Wild West. William Hazelgrove says this, Truly Roosevelt could have been shot right there in the little scrub town of the Badlands and the course of American history would have changed forever. Ironically, the sickly boy who started boxing simply so he could breathe would one day use those same skills to knock out a murderous bully in a Wild West town. But in doing so, Teddy Roosevelt entered into myth and would be forever wed to this evanescent moment in the history of the American West. Teddy Roosevelt, speaking of the Wild West, the romance of my life began here. Now remember, if you have context for this, this part of his life is the most difficult. And yet he is going to declare that the romance of his life, the beauty, the adventure, the grand scope of what he is going to do with his life starts right here. This is the basis. The same is true for all of you. We all have some asthmatic condition. We all are going to be assigned these buffalo hunts, but to some of us, they're not bully buffalo hunts. And all of us are going to face trial, difficulty, traumas, griefs, just like Roosevelt. And yet 
are we going to be able to look back on these sectors of our life and say that that's where God made me strong? Yes, it was out of that that the beauty in my life was formed. William Hazelgrove says this, we associate Theodore Roosevelt with what would become his famous larger than life persona. The barrel chested, teeth snapping, big stick wielding, swaggering cowboy expansionist who exemplified the vigorous life of the early 20th century. The vigorous life was the creed by which Roosevelt lived. And for him, the cowboy was its apotheosis. Through Roosevelt's influence, the idea of the cowboy made an indelible mark on American culture. William Hazelgrove continues, the West delivered this 125 pound man, this dude, a great adventure. He faced down gunmen, grizzly bears, thieves, rustlers, unscrupulous ranchers, ruthless outlaws, and Indians. He has story after story after story. They're all incredible. He had the breath knocked out of him by overturned horses, cracked a rib, dislocated a shoulder, and nearly froze to death more than once, getting lost in the hell that is the Badlands, all while fighting chronic asthma and ignoring a physician's admonition to protect his weak heart and lead the sedentary life of a recluse. To recover from the twin blows of losing both his mother and his wife on the same day, and in his quest to find his way again, Theodore Roosevelt would push himself to the point where his broken heart would either heal or stop forever. The West was just the place for such a contest. Teddy Roosevelt, question number four. So each of these episodes, if you've missed the first three, I finish with a question. Something for us to ask our own soul to bring this to a place of examination so that we don't just hear truth, but we apply it. Are you backing up your Christianity with action? Are you actually putting the muscle into your Christianity? You just have your brain uh, chewing on it because Christianity is an action thing. Faith is meant to move us forward, not to just consider ideas and to just go, ha, ah, interesting. Do you actually believe you have authority over the bad guys or is it merely nice sounding rhetoric? You see, if you know that you have authority over bad guys, then you don't fear the bad guys. You see, we, are, we give ourselves away when we hide in the corner and when we cower before the issues of earth today because the world is conspiring to stomp out truth. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there are conspiracies out there. They're called the devil's agenda to stomp out the truth in this world. The devil is very much against the son of God and everything the son of God is after. He's against the church of Jesus Christ. And so his design is and always has been and always will be to stop us. The question is, do you know the authority that you have? I don't care if the guy is wielding six shooters. He has a foul mouth and he's asking you to do his bidding. You need to know that you have been commissioned by the most high God to actually stand up to the bad guys in this world. I mean, I don't know that I'm wired to do that naturally. I don't know that that's the way I was trained. It's like, Eric, I want you to go out to the wild west and when that bad guy is going around with his six shooters and gonna kill someone, you stand up to him. Whoa, like, oh, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. You don't wanna do that. And yet everything about Christianity is bold, is daring. It does not mean it's unwise. I'm not actually wanting to encourage a lack of wisdom, but it's actually a greater wisdom to move forward and to put action behind our faith than to cower. Are you willing to actually migrate from weakness to strength and to take it to the foul-mouthed devil? You see, some of you could hear my story about standing up, you know, for truth and actually having real world repercussions. Oh, I could have a whole series on real world repercussions for standing for truth. My little diddly squat story about floods in the Ludi house, that's nothing. The amount of attack I've had on my life is very heavy duty. And the amount of times I have heard that voice saying, give up, Ludi you recognize you're not getting anywhere. You recognize that things are only getting worse in this world and you're taking it on the chin the whole time. It's a pretty good argument. It's like, Eric, you're not changing anything anyways. Why do you keep taking it on the chin? Yeah, why do I keep taking it on the chin? As opposed to standing up and saying, I know in whom I believe 
and I do not fear you. I don't fear your bluff. I don't fear your bluster. I've said to Leslie so many times, you know what? If the enemy could, he would kill me, but he can't. If the enemy could, he would stop me, but he can't. We're still going. And even though he has put together quite a, you know, a scene to get us to give up, he can't stop us. And once you start to get that, where you no longer listen to the devil's bluster, and you listen to the clear word of God that anyone who builds their life upon him will not falter, will not fall, will not crumble when things beat against it. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Teddy Roosevelt, quote number four. This quote is on the imperative of action, action, action. You guys will like this quote. This is a great one. Teddy Roosevelt said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, but because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds. Who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Father, we don't want to be of the cold and timid variety. But American Christianity hatches cold and timid Christians. We want to be of a different variety. The robust, the strong, the athletic, the muscular. Lord, this is a work of grace, but we have to decide to begin to move forward. To move out of our coldness and our timidity. To move into the warmth and the heat of radical abandon. Lord Jesus, we want to follow you. Knowing full well it comes with a cross. Knowing full well it comes with a denial of self. Knowing full well it comes with sufferings. But Lord Jesus, it also comes with your presence, your power, your intimate fellowship, your strength, your protection, your provision, your supply. That everything we need for life and godliness, everything we need for this journey will be given us. That is our confidence. Lord, I pray that we would rise up with a whole new level of strength and conviction today. Lord, our goal isn't to grow up to be like Teddy Roosevelt. It's to grow up to be like you. Our desire is to emulate you, is to find the life of Christ emanating in us and out of us. Lord, we love you. You are our true hero of history. We pray these things in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen.